video, we're going to learn about a new set of trigonometric identities, what we call the sum and difference identities, or the sum and difference formulas. So most importantly, these formulas are going to allow us to calculate trigonometric values for angles that are on the unit circle, but maybe haven't been identified. So in terms of the key angles that we highlight on the unit circle, you'll note that they're all multiples of 35 degrees, or not 30, excuse me, 30, 30 degrees and 45 degrees, there we go, or possibly multiples of both. So for instance, 90 degrees can be written in terms of 30 and in terms of 45 degrees. Well, just because those are the angles we highlight does not mean that they're the only angles on the unit circle. In between any set of highlighted angles, we have also um, infinitely many other angles that aren't highlighted. Well, what happens if we want to know things about the trigonometric values of other angles? For instance, um, maybe 50 degrees, maybe 35 degrees, something between 30 and 45. Those angles are there, but because we don't know anything about the coordinates when we take a, um, an amount of rotation like that, um, we don't know specifically what their sine or their cosine would be. So the sum and difference formulas are going to allow us to evaluate our functions for some angle that is a sum or a difference of those special angles that have been labeled. So in other words, if we have an angle we want to evaluate, maybe it's sine, it's cosine, any of the six functions, but perhaps it's not an angle that's been labeled on the unit circle. If we could take a pair of angles that are labeled, that we do have information about, and maybe combine those angles either using addition or subtraction, then we can generate that new angle and we can use one of these formulas we're about to look at to determine what the sine, what the cosine, what the tangent, or what the other three function values would be for that angle that's not labeled, but again has been related to angles that are labeled. So here's our set of formulas. We have two formulas each for each of our three fundamental trigonometric functions. So for our sine, suppose we want to take the sine of two angles that have been added together. So we're going to assume that U and V are angles. They could be in degrees, they could be in radians, doesn't matter. So if we take the sine of a sum of two angles, that's going to be the sine of the first angle multiplied by the cosine of the second angle and then we're going to add the cosine of the first angle and the sine of the second angle. So notice these two terms look similar, they are different. This is the sine of the first, the cosine of the first, this is the cosine of the second, and the sine of the second. Now if we switch to subtraction, so the sine of two angles that have been subtracted, you'll notice we have the exact same terms, but we've changed from addition to subtraction. So when we're taking the sum of two angles, our formula involves addition. When we take the difference of two angles, our formula involves subtraction. Now, if we want to take the cosine of two angles that have been added together, that's going to be the cosine of the first times the cosine of the second minus, notice the sine has flipped. It's gonna flip with our cosine formulas. So minus the sine of the first times the sine of the second angle. And just as with the sine formulas, with the cosine formulas, we flip the sine that was inside of the expression we want to evaluate. So for the cosine difference formula, we have the same pair of terms, but now we've changed to addition. So with the cosine formulas, if we want to evaluate the sum of two angles, it's going to be subtraction in our formula. If we want to evaluate the difference, it's going to be addition in our formula. But again, notice the terms are gonna be the same in both cases. Now for the tangent formulas, we do see a similar pattern. These formulas are just a little bit more complicated. So the tangent of a sum of two angles is going to be in the numerator of our formula, the sum of the two individual tangents for those individual angles. And in the denominator, it's gonna be one minus the product of the two tangents. Now, if we're taking the tangent of a difference, same terms in the same order, but we're gonna flip the signs. So when there's addition, the numerator has addition, the denominator has subtraction. When we're evaluating a um, difference of two angles, the numerator has subtraction and the denominator has addition. So the angles, or excuse me, the, um, the signs are gonna flip. 
So how do we use formulas like this to calculate a trigonometric value for an angle we don't have labeled? Well, for instance, suppose we want to find the exact value of the cosine of 15 degrees. Well, let's first off, let's type this into the calculator and see what the cosine of 15 degrees is. So double check that your calculator is in degree mode. If it's not, you need to make sure to change it over. So I'm gonna put my calculator in degree mode. Okay, and then I want to evaluate the cosine of 15 degrees. And that's gonna be the cosine of 15 degrees. So close to the number one. The cosine of zero degrees is gonna be one. So the cosine of 15 degrees, which is a really small angle, is gonna be something close to one. But that's not going to be the exact value. That's gonna be a rounded version. That's gonna be an approximation of this value. So how would we find the exact value of the cosine of 15 degrees? Well, we're gonna to have to use what we know from the unit circle. So the way I can use a sum or a difference identity here is by taking 15 degrees and either writing it as the sum of two angles that add up to give me 15 degrees or the difference of two angles that would subtract to give me 15 degrees. And this is gonna take some trial and error. Sometimes it's gonna immediately stand out what pair you would use that could either add up or subtract to give you 15 degrees. Sometimes it's gonna be a little bit more complicated. It just depends. So when I see 15 degrees, one pair that stands out to me is 45 degrees and 30. Number one, I know everything I need to know about 45 degrees and 30 degrees. I can find the values of all six trigonometric functions for those two just based on what I see on the unit circle. But why those angles specifically? Well, I know if I take 45 degrees and subtract 30 degrees from it, I land at 15 degrees. So even though 15 degrees is not labeled on the unit circle, because I can write it as the difference of two angles that are labeled, I can use this formula, use the information I have about the two angles that are labeled, that we do have values for, and then use that formula to find this value that I don't know, this value that I want to determine. So I'm gonna write the cosine of 15 degrees as the cosine of 45 degrees minus 30 degrees. Again, because we know everything we need to know about 45 and 30, we take their difference and that gives us 15 degrees. Now here's something that's very tempting to do that you cannot do. This is not the same thing as the cosine of 45 degrees. I'm gonna write something down, but I'm gonna write that it's not equal. This is not the same thing as the cosine of 45 degrees minus the cosine of 30 degrees. That is not correct. That is not the way to evaluate this expression. If it were, we wouldn't have a set of formulas to evaluate something like this. We would just do what seems to be intuitive. Cosine is not a number. Cosine does not distribute. Cosine, it just does not work that way. Cosine is a function, and we're evaluating this function applied to a difference of two inputs. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as just evaluating the cosine of each and then subtracting. We have to use the cosine difference formula, which tells us we wanna take the cosine of each angle, we wanna take the sine of each angle, and then we want to add those two terms together. So what this is actually going to be is the cosine of 45 degrees times the cosine of 30 degrees and then again, the general rule with the cosine formulas is that whatever sign you have in your expression you're evaluating, it's going to flip when you use your formula. So we're going to add the sine of 45 degrees times the sine of 30 degrees. And so whatever this evaluates to, this is the exact value of the cosine of 15 degrees. And we can find all of these values directly from the unit circle. So the cosine of 45 degrees is going to be the square root of two over two. We're multiplying by the cosine of 30 degrees, which is gonna be the square root of three over two. Okay, so that's gonna be one term. And to that, we are adding the sine of 45 degrees, which is gonna be the square root of two over two, 
times the sine of 30 degrees, which is going to be 1 half. So we have two terms added together, and we have a product within each of those terms. So the next thing we need to do is we need to multiply each of our pairs together. So for the first pair, you multiply the numerator and the denominator straight across. Now in the numerator, notice we have two square roots multiplied together. There's a rule for radicals that says if we take the product of two radicals, that's the same thing as the radical of the product. So we can take the radicands, the numbers under those two radicals, and we can just multiply them and put them under a common square root. So two times three is gonna give me six. So the square root of two times the square root of three is equivalent to the square root of six. Now the denominator, two times two, is gonna give me four. Keep in mind, we're not doing anything with a common denominator. When we multiply fractions, we just multiply the numerators and denominators straight across. Now to that, we're adding the product of these two terms. So our numerator is gonna be the square root of two and our denominator in this case, two times two, also gonna give us four. So the only additional thing we may want to do, because we do have a common denominator, we can combine these two numerators with addition and write them over that common denominator of four. Do these combine any further? The answer is no. They may both be square roots, but because they don't have the same radic radicand, the number under the radical is not the same, those are not considered like terms and they don't combine. So that is gonna be our final answer. That's as far as it goes. Well, how can we check and make sure that answer is actually correct? Well, one way to do that is to plug it into the calculator, determine what this is equal to, at least roughly approximate that, and make sure that it matches up with the approximation we got for cosine of 15 degrees. Now make sure if you wanna type this all in in one line, that you put your numerator in parentheses. So the square root of six plus, oops, left out my plus sign, plus the square root of two. Okay, arrow out, close it. And then we're dividing all of that as one unit by four. And if I hit enter, well notice I get the same value. So that does confirm this would be um, another way of writing cosine in 50 degrees. This would be the exact value of cosine of 15 degrees. Now let's try another one. So sine of 11, this should be a pi. My printer cut it off for some reason. 11 pi over 12. Okay, so this angle is given in radians. So 11 pi over 12, that's gonna be a radian measure that's very close to pi. We know at pi, the sine has a value of zero. So in theory, this should be a value that's very close to zero. So let me change to radians in my calculator. I'm gonna change over to radians. And then let's get an approximation for this. So the sine of 11 pi over 12. There we go. And sure enough, it's a pretty small number, something relatively close to zero. Now again, that's just an approximation, but we want the exact value of this trigonometric expression. So what we can do is, if we can find a pair of angles that either adds up to give us 11 pi over 12, or subtracts to give us 11 pi over 12, well then we can apply one of these two formulas to evaluate this expression using what we know about those, um, those angles that we chose and we related in that specific way. But how do you find the angles here? Because if you'll notice, when you look at the unit circle, all of the angles we have labeled have a denominator of six, four, or three. We don't have any that have a denominator of 12. So what do we do? How do we find the pair that works? Well, start with just a little bit of trial and error. What we wanna do is we wanna see if we can find a pair, some pair of numbers, that combines to give us 11 pi over 12. Now, because this is relatively large, it's not something small like 15. Because 15 was small, it made sense to generate it using subtraction. Well, this is a little bit bigger, so maybe try generating this one using addition. So essentially what I wanna do is I wanna take 11 pi over 12 and split it up into the sum of two different radian measures. And I just wanna investigate how many ways can I do this 
and is there a way to do this that will allow me to use, um, use angles we have labeled on the unit circle to generate this number. So what's one way to split up 11 pi over 12 into the sum of two things? Well, one way to do that would be take a single pi over 12 and add on additional 10 pi over 12. That would be one way to write 11 pi over 12 as the sum of two angles. Does this help me? Well, 10 pi over 12, what is that? That needs to reduce. That could reduce to 5 pi over 6. Well, 5 pi over 6 is something we have labeled on the unit circle. 5 pi over 6 is in the second quadrant. We know it's x and y value, so we know it's cosine and sine, which means that would work, that would help. But pi over 12 is not an angle we have labeled on the unit circle. The smallest angle we have labeled that's larger than zero is gonna be pi over six. So this pair doesn't help us because only one of the angles is already labeled on the unit circle. We wanna find a pair where both angles are labeled. Well, if we were to increase this fraction and decrease this one accordingly, how about 2 pi over 12, and then the other term we would need would be 9 pi over 12. How about that pair? Well, what would happen if we reduce these? Notice both of those can be reduced. This would reduce to pi over 6, and this would reduce to, common factor of 3, 3 pi over 4. Well, pi over 6, 3 pi over 4, those are both key angles labeled on the unit circle. So this pair, again resulting from this pair in a non-reduced form, does actually add up to 11 pi over 12, but more importantly it adds up, but it's also a pair of angles that we know things about. We have both of those able, angles labeled on the unit circle. So this would be a pair that we could use because we have everything we need to know about those two individual constituent angles. So for the sine of 11 pi over 12, we're gonna rewrite that as the sine of the sum of these two angles, these two angles that add up to give me 11 pi over 12. So that's gonna be the sine of pi over six plus three pi over four. Now again, just like before, we cannot just split it up into the sum of these two angles. If we could, there would be no need for any set of formulas here. We have to use the formula. So the formula tells me if I'm taking the sine of two angles that have been added together, that's going to be the sine of the first, the cosine of the second, so the product of those two, plus the cosine of the first times the sine of the second. So the sine of the first angle, the sine of pi over six, times the cosine of the second, which is three pi over four, plus the cosine of the first angle, times the sine of the second angle. And just as before, now we just need to evaluate these, and we can evaluate these four values just based on what we know about the unit circle. So the sine at pi over six radians, well pi over six, 30 degrees, that represents the same amount of rotation. So the sine at pi over six is going to be one half. Okay, the cosine of three pi over four, remember three pi over four is in the second quadrant, so the cosine is gonna have a negative value. That's gonna be negative root two over two. And to that we are adding the cosine of pi over six, which is gonna be root three over two, times the sine of three pi over four. Well, in the second quadrant, the y value is still going to be positive, so the sine is still going to be positive. So that's gonna be positive root two over two. Okay, well now we just need to clean it up just like we did before. So we have two terms, we have a product within each term, so multiply your numerator straight across in each of these pairs. So one times the negative square root of two would be the negative square root of two, and then our denominator is gonna be four, plus root three times root two, we saw that a moment ago, that's gonna be the square root of six, also divided by four. So again, we can combine over that common denominator, 
So that's going to be negative root 2 plus root 6 over the common denominator of 4. Or another way to write this would be the square root of 6 minus the square root of 2 over that denominator of 4. As long as we keep the signs consistent, we can flip the order and maybe write it in this way. It looks a little bit better. Now keep in mind, if you chose a different pair of angles to add up to 11 pi over 12, or even if you just flipped the order of these two angles, you might end up with this answer to start with rather than this one. But keep in mind, they are equivalent. They are the same thing. So in either case, either would be acceptable. Notice also we have essentially the same components that we did for each of these answers. The only thing that changed is that one of the signs flipped. You're going to find that that happens a lot, specifically when you take the sine and cosine using one of these sum and difference formulas. You're going to see lots of root 2s, lots of root 6s, and lots of denominators of 4. Well, let's verify that this is, in fact, the correct answer. So we have an approximation of our sine value. Let's see if our exact value is consistent with that. So negative root 2 plus root 6 and all of that is divided by 4. Sure enough, same value. So that confirms this would be our exact value. So in this case, generate one, generating one of the radian measures is sometimes a little bit more difficult. The idea is just to play around with different ways to break it up using that same denominator. Um, sometimes you'll break it up in a way that works, in a way that uses angles that are labeled on the unit circles. Sometimes you won't. If you don't, you try another pair until you eventually find a pair that works. And of course, we could do this with addition. We could, just, we could do this with subtraction as well. Okay, let's look at a tangent. Tangent is a little bit more complicated. Okay, and let's do another radian measure because those are worth practicing with. So we want to find the tangent of negative pi over 12. Okay, so negative pi over 12, we're talking about a negative angle. So if we're rotating from zero, that's going to be a negative angle that takes us into the fourth quadrant. So we know in the fourth quadrant, tangent is going to have negative values. So let's see if we can approximate this, determine what this is going to look like. So tangent of negative pi over 12. Sure enough, again, it's a negative value. Okay, so whatever we get as our exact value needs to approximate to this same number. Okay, so if we want an exact value, again, we need to write negative pi over 12 as either a sum or a difference of two angles that we do have information about that are labeled on the unit circle. Okay, well, what do we do here? Because this is a negative angle. It's probably going to be easier to use subtraction to generate a negative angle. We know we get a negative result if we take a smaller number and subtract a larger number from it. That's going to give us a negative result. So probably we're looking for a smaller angle minus a larger angle, but specifically a pair that combines to give us negative pi over 12. So let's just try some. Let's see if we can find a pair that works. So what if we started with just pi over 12? Well, what would we have to subtract to get to negative pi over 12? We'd have to subtract 2 pi over 12. So pi over 12, that's fully reduced. 2 pi over 12 reduces 2 pi over 6. So does that help? Well, pi over 6, we have information about that. Pi over 12, we don't. So that's not going to be a pair that works. So what if we increased the first angle? What if we increased it from pi over 12 to 2 pi over 12? Well, what would we have to subtract from 2 pi over 12 to get negative pi over 12? We would have to subtract 3 pi over 12. Well, is that going to work? What do those two reduce to? Again, 2 pi over 12 reduces to pi over 6. What about 3 pi over 12? Well, 3 and 12 have a common factor of 3. Divide out that common factor. And we have a pi over 4. Pi over 6, pi over 4, those are both radian measures that are already labeled on the unit circle. We can find their sine. We can find their cosines. We can find their tangents. So this is going to be a pair that works. And again, keep in mind, this pair is not unique. There are a lot of other ways to generate this angle as well. 
This may be the first one to find, this may be the easiest one to find, but if you find another pair that combines to give you negative pi over 12, and it also results from angles that are already labeled on the unit circle, well, you can use that pair too, it's not gonna make a difference. Okay, so let's evaluate this. So we're taking the tangent of the difference of these two angles. So the tangent of pi over six, minus pi over four. Okay, so let's go back to our formulas. Let's look at the tangent formulas. So we have a tangent of a difference. So that's gonna be the tangent of each angle subtracted, divided by one plus the product of the tangents. Now notice in the numerator, the order is gonna matter. It's the tangent of the first minus the tangent of the second. And then the denominator order is not a big deal, but in the numerator, it is. So our numerator is going to be the tangent of our first angle, so the tangent of pi over six, minus the tangent of our second angle, pi over four, divided by one plus the product of those two tangents. Okay, so how do we evaluate the tangents in this case? We can't immediately look at the unit circle and just based on the coordinates pull out the tangent. The tangent combines two coordinates. So tangent is defined as our sine divided by our cosine for any um, degree measure, any radian measure. Okay, so I'm gonna go out to the side and I'm going to evaluate each of these tangents. So first, pi over six. What is the tangent of pi over six? Well, tangent is defined as the sine divided by the cosine evaluated at that particular angle measure. Okay, so what is the sine of pi over six? Well, at pi over six, our sine has a value of one half, and then our cosine has a value of root three over two. Okay, so that common two divides out, so that's gonna be one divided by root three and if we rationalize that, that's gonna be the square root of three over three. So that is our value for tangent of pi over six. Now what about the tangent of pi over four? Again, sine divided by cosine, so at pi over four, our sine is gonna be root two over two. Our cosine is also going to be root two over two. Well, anything divided by itself comes out to one. So the tangent of pi over four is going to be one. So let's sub in all of that information. So the tangent of pi over six is root three over three. And then the tangent of pi over four is being subtracted. So that's gonna be subtracted one. Now notice in our denominator, we have the same values for tangent. So we just sub those in again. So one plus the tangent of pi over six which was root three over three times the tangent of pi over four, which is one. Now we have a fraction inside of a fraction, which is a problem, okay? So we need to get rid of the fractions inside of the fractions. We also have an issue with there being a radical in the denominator, this is not rationalized. So there's a couple layers to how we have to simplify um, something that's structured like this. First thing we want to focus on though is the fact that we have fractions inside of fractions. That's a problem, we want to get rid of that. So here's a quick way to get rid of the complex fraction, get rid of the fractions inside the fractions. Look at the two expressions that have denominators. Notice in this case they both have a denominator of three. Find the least common denominator, which in this case, since they have the same, it's gonna be a denominator of three. And we're gonna multiply in the numerator by that number and also in the denominator by that number. So the numerator we're gonna multiply by three, the denominator we're gonna multiply by three as well. As long as we do the same thing on the top and bottom, we're really just multiplying by one, which will change how this looks, but will not change its actual algebraic value. Now I'm gonna put parentheses around my numerator and my denominator. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I have to remember that when I multiply by something that has a subtraction or addition, 
I have to distribute into parentheses. That's going to be important. So in my numerator, that 3 has to distribute to both terms. Now what happens when it distributes to the first term? Here's why we multiplied by 3. If you distribute the 3 to the first term, we have root 3 over 3 multiplied by 3 over 1, which means the 3's are going to cancel and we're just going to be left with the square root of 3. Now don't forget to distribute it here. That's just going to be 3 times 1, which is going to be 3, so minus 3. Now something similar is going to happen in the denominator. Again, we have to distribute to both terms. So 3 times 1 is going to give us 3. We're adding. And then 3 distributed to the second term, which is really just root 3 over 3. Well, the 3's are going to cancel. So 3 over 1, think of this as 3 over 1. Root 3 over 3. And then 3 over 1, your 3's cancel diagonally. And you're just left with the square root of 3. So in that one step, we're able to get rid of the complex fraction. So we now just have something that is unfortunately not rationalized. We do need to rationalize this. Now, normally when we rationalize, we just multiply in the numerator and denominator by what happens to be irrational, just the square root we want to get rid of. We're in a slightly different situation here because notice our denominator has more than just the term with the square root. It also has a term that's rational. So we use a slightly different strategy here. We talked about this strategy a little bit when we talked about verifying identities. We're going to multiply by what we call the conjugate. So if we're starting with something of the form a plus b, its conjugate is going to have the same terms, but we're going to flip the sign. And it does go both directions. So if we multiply by whatever the conjugate is, of whatever we're trying to rationalize, that will rationalize for us. So specifically, we're attempting to rationalize our denominator, which has addition as part of it. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator, which again is going to have the same terms, but the terms are going to be subtracted. So I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of my denominator, which is 3 minus the square root of 3. Now in order to keep things in balance, I have to do the same thing in the numerator. I have to multiply by the exact same factor. And there we go. And again, I'm going to put parentheses so I remember all of this has to be foiled out. Okay, so let's start with the numerator. We're going to have to foil out this pair of binomials. So our first pair, root 3 times 3, We'll write that in a little bit better order as 3 root 3. Okay, our outer pair, we have a positive and a negative, so the sign is going to be negative. And then root 3 times root 3, well that's root 3 squared. We square a square root and the radical goes away, so that's just going to be a 3. Our inner pair, negative 3 times positive 3, well that's going to be a negative 9. And then our outer pair, two negatives, make a positive. And then 3 times root 3 is going to be 3 root 3. And then we'll take another step to clean that up. What about the denominator? Well, the goal was to rationalize the denominator, to get rid of that radical. Does the radical, in fact, go away? Well, let's see. Let's foil it out. So my first pair, 3 times 3, that's going to give me 9. Now I'm not going to write the outer pair, I just want to look at it. So 3 times negative root 3, negative 3 root 3. Now rather than writing it down, let's look at the inner pair. So this was negative 3 root 3. What's the inner pair? The inner pair is going to be positive 3 root 3. So negative 3 root 3 combined with a positive 3 root 3. Well those terms would be equal and opposite, which means we combine them together and they combine to zero, they cancel each other out. Well, what are we left with then? We only have the last pair, so positive and negative, that's gonna be negative, and then root three times root three, that's root three squared, that's just gonna be a three. So how did the rationalization occur here? It occurred because the outer terms and the inner terms, the terms that actually had a radical as part of them, 
they ended up being equal and opposite and they ended up canceling. Essentially what we have here is the factored form of a difference of squares. It's one term plus another, same term minus that same other term. So this is really just the factored form of a difference of squares. When we FOIL this out, it ends up being the first term squared, which gave us nine, and then the second term squared, which gave us three, and it's the difference of those two. But notice more importantly here, it's rationalized. The radical is gone. So now we just want to combine everything that we can in our numerator, clean up that denominator. So we have three root three plus three root three. So we have six root three in total. Okay, we have negative three minus nine. So that's going to be negative 12. And then our denominator, nine minus three is gonna give us six. And then the only additional thing we want to do, which we can do here, is we want to cancel out any common factors among all the terms in our problem. So notice in the numerator, we have a common factor of six. So I can factor out that common factor of six, which is going to leave me with a square root of three, and then 12 divided by six is gonna give me two. What's the benefit of doing that? Well, the benefit of doing that is we now have that common factor that cancels with the denominator. Six divided by six, they reduce to one. And so that simplifies our answer down to the square root of three minus two. So there we go. Supposedly, that's our exact answer. Well, let's check it. Let's plug that into the calculator. So the square root of three minus two and there we go, it matches up. So that is going to be our value for our tangent. Notice this was a little bit more involved. It was a little bit more involved because the formula we used was a little bit more complicated. Automatically, tangent is a little bit more complicated to find, and the tangent sum and difference formulas are also a little bit more complicated, which means it's gonna take a little bit more work in the middle to simplify the expression down into something that's workable. Okay. Let's look at a couple other examples, different kinds of examples. So we looked at a few examples where we had an actual angle given, it was an angle that wasn't labeled on the unit circle, but it could be written either as a sum or a difference of angles that are labeled on the unit circle. We can actually use these formulas in other ways as well. So these formulas can also be used, number one, when angles are unknown, so maybe we don't know the actual angle itself, but we have information about one or more of the angles, pairs of trigonometric values. So maybe we don't know the angle, but we know enough to be able to label a triangle representing each of the angles. And also we can use um, these formulas when our angle pairs are derived from inverse functions. Remember, when we have an inverse trig function, we're inputting coordinates, we're outputting an angle, either an angle in degrees or an angle in radians. So an angle can also be represented by an inverse trig function. If that's the case, um, we can also use our sum and difference formulas, but maybe use them in a slightly different way. So here's our setup. We wanna find the exact value of the cosine of alpha minus beta, so these are two angles, the cosine of the difference of those two. Given that, maybe we don't know these exact angles, but we have a trigonometric value for each of them. So we've been told that the sine of our first angle is negative four over five, and the cosine of our second angle is negative five over eight. Well, as soon as we have negative values, it's possible that our angles exist somewhere outside of the first quadrant. So we've been told that alpha is in quadrant three and beta is an angle that's somewhere in quadrant two. Well, as soon as I have unknown angles, but I have a trigonometric value, immediately that's an indication that we're not using the unit circle, we're going to draw a triangle. So anytime we have a trigonometric value and we know where our angle is located within the coordinate plane, that's gonna be enough information to draw a right triangle to represent what we know about that angle. 
Okay, now you want to draw a separate coordinate plane for each of your angles, just so you don't get confused, just so the labeling doesn't get a little bit convoluted. So we want to have one coordinate plane for alpha, one coordinate plane for beta. Okay, so we've been told that the sine of alpha is negative four over five, and alpha is specifically an angle in quadrant three. So I'm gonna draw my right triangle in quadrant three. So here's my right angle, there's my alpha, and the sine of alpha is negative four over five. So my opposite over hypotenuse is gonna be negative four over five. Now we know the hypotenuse always has a positive length, and since we're in the third quadrant, it makes sense that our opposite side would have a negative length. Okay, now this is the this is two parts of a Pythagorean triple. The other side has to have a length of three, but again, because we're in quadrant three, that means it's going to be a negative three. And if you need, take a minute, use the Pythagorean theorem and verify that. Okay, now what about beta? Beta, we've been told, is in quadrant two. So I'm gonna draw another right triangle, this time in quadrant two. Okay, and the cosine of beta is negative five over eight. So that means our adjacent over our hypotenuse is negative five over eight. And again, the legs of the triangle can have negative lengths, but the hypotenuse always has to have a positive length. Now this pair doesn't represent a Pythagorean triple, so we do need to solve for that additional side. So we know that negative five squared plus our unknown squared is gonna be equal to the length of our hypotenuse squared. So negative five squared, that's gonna be 25, plus y squared is equal to 64. So y squared is equal to 64 minus 25, which is gonna be 39. So y is going to be the positive or the negative square root of 39. Now it's one or the other, not both. Which one is it? Well, we have to base that on the quadrant we're in. So because beta is in the second quadrant, we know that um, ordered pairs in the second quadrant will have a negative x coordinate, but a positive y coordinate. So that means it's going to be positive root 39. Well, now that we have two triangles, one representing alpha, one representing beta, fully labeled, we have enough information to determine the value of cosine of alpha minus beta. So we need all the information we can find about the two angles, and because we're evaluating the cosine of the difference of those two, we also need the cosine difference formula. Okay, so the cosine difference formula tells us we're gonna take the cosine of each angle and we're going to add the sine of each angle. So the cosine of alpha minus beta is going to be the cosine of each, the product of those two. So cosine alpha, cosine beta, and then flip the sine, so plus sine alpha, sine beta. Okay, well what are these values? We're not gonna find them from the unit circle, we're gonna find them from the triangles we just drew. So the cosine of alpha, make sure you're looking at the correct angle, the correct triangle. That's why we put it on two separate coordinate planes and label each of them. So the cosine of alpha is your adjacent divided by your hypotenuse. So negative three over five. And then we're multiplying by the cosine of beta. So adjacent over hypotenuse, negative five over eight. Okay, plus, because of the formula, plus the sine of alpha, so opposite over hypotenuse, which is negative four over five, times the sine of beta, opposite over hypotenuse, so root 39 over eight. Now one thing I want you to notice at this moment we basically have the same structure as we did for the previous problems where we had an angle that was given. We found a pair of actual known angles. Notice the two denominators are gonna be the same. Just like in those cases, in this case, the two denominators are gonna be the same. So when we clean up each of these terms, we're going to have a common denominator already, okay? 
So my first term in my numerator, negative 3 times negative 5 is going to give me a positive 15. And then 5 times 8 is going to give me a 40. Okay, for my second pair, it's added, but we have a negative times a positive, which is a negative. So it's going to become subtraction. 4 root 39, well, that's just 4 root 39. 39, root 39 is fully simplified. The rational part does not go into the irrational part. It's just a factor that stays on the outside. And then that also has a denominator of 5 times 8, which is 40. So all we can do then is, because we have that common denominator, take those two numerators, join them together. So 15 minus 4 root 39 over 40. And that is going to be the value of our cosine. Now, unfortunately, in this situation, because we don't know what the angles actually are, we don't really have a good option for verifying that this is the correct value. There is potentially a way to do it using inverse trig functions, but it's going to be a lot more convoluted than is worth our time. But as long as we've labeled our triangles correctly, we've used the formula correctly, we've plugged in all the correct values, then we can expect that this answer will be correct. Now let's take the same kind of problem and let's take another kind of variation of it. Okay, now this looks really complicated when you look at this expression, but it's not as bad as it looks, I promise. So we want to find the exact value of the sine of the tangent inverse of negative 9 over 40 plus the cosine inverse of 8 over 17. Okay, so forget about the fact that we have the sine of two things that are added. Let's just focus on those two individual inverse trig functions, that tangent inverse, that cosine inverse. Okay, now when we take any type of inverse trig function, when we evaluate an inverse trig function, we're plugging in coordinates or the sides of the right triangle, something like that, and we're outputting an angle an angle in a specific quadrant. We know our inverse trig functions correspond to specific quadrants when we evaluate them. The angle has to be in a specific quadrant. So we may have the tangent inverse of negative 9 over 40, but it's really just an angle. It's some angle. We don't know what it is yet, but it's just some angle. So I'm going to call this angle alpha. Okay. Now what do I know about alpha? Well, I know it came from a tangent inverse. What do we know about inverse tangent? Well, we know it's either going to give you an angle in the first quadrant or a negative angle in the fourth quadrant that we get from rotating backwards from zero. How do we know where our alpha is? Is it in the first quadrant? Is it in the second quadrant? Well, if we take a tangent inverse of negative 9 over 40, which of these quadrants is going to correspond to negative values for tangent? Well, that's going to have to be an angle in the fourth quadrant. So because alpha is represented as the inverse tangent of a negative value, automatically that tells me that alpha has to be in the fourth quadrant. It's a negative angle in the fourth quadrant. So I'm going to draw a triangle to represent it. So here's my coordinate plane for alpha. Well, how do I label my triangle? Well, let's go a little bit further. So I'm going to come out to the side. We've decided that this tangent inverse of negative 9 over 40, we're just going to call that alpha. We know it represents an angle. We're going to call that angle alpha. Well, we need a trigonometric value in order to label our coordinate plane. So if we know that alpha is defined as the inverse tangent of negative 9 over 40, Another way to say that is that the tangent of alpha is equal to negative 9 over 40. Those two statements mean the same thing, just written in a different way. The only thing that we need to know based on the fact that we're looking at an inverse tangent versus just being given this information is that inverse tangent is specific in terms of which quadrants it corresponds to. So once we determine that we have to be in quadrant 4, based on how alpha is defined, well then all we need is the trigonometric value. So we know that the opposite and the adjacent give us our tangent. So opposite and adjacent 
This needs to come out to a negative ratio though. So which one is gonna be negative, which is positive? Well, that's just gonna depend on the quadrant. So because we're in quadrant four, X, our adjacent side, should be positive, and Y, our opposite side, should be negative. So opposite over adjacent, so nine over 40, and since we're in the fourth quadrant, we know it's gonna to have to be the nine that is negative. Now, this is also a Pythagorean triple. The length of the hypotenuse is gonna be 41. Again, you can check that with the Pythagorean theorem if you need, take a moment, pause the video and do that. Okay, now we also need another triangle to represent inverse cosine of eight over 17. So again, this, what is this? This represents an angle. If we take the inverse cosine of eight over 17, we're asking the question, what angle would give us a cosine of eight over 17? So this represents, in general, some unknown angle. Let's call it beta. Well, what quadrant is beta gonna be in? What do we know about inverse cosine? We know when we take the inverse cosine and match it to an angle, it's either gonna be an angle in the first quadrant, if the cosine is positive, or it's gonna be an angle in the second quadrant, if the cosine is negative. Well, we're taking the inverse cosine of positive coordinates, which means beta has to be an angle in the first quadrant. So this is going to be the location for beta. Now, and again, in order to label my right triangle, I need a trig value. So if we've said that beta is equal to the inverse cosine of eight over 17, Another way of saying that is that the cosine of beta is equal to eight over 17. And again, we know we're in quadrant one because of what we know about inverse cosine. It either gives us an angle in quadrant one or in quadrant two. In quadrant one, all of the cosines are positive. In quadrant two, all of the cosines are negative. So here we're talking about a co positive co uh, cosine, excuse me, um, and that's gonna be a first quadrant angle. So we have information to label our triangle now. So adjacent over hypotenuse, that's gonna be eight over 17, and based on our quadrant, we know everything's gonna be positive. Now this is also a Pythagorean triple, and you're gonna find that this side has a length of 15. Well, once we have our two triangles labeled, again, we have everything we need. So focus not on this full expression but think about what we sort of abbreviated it to, how we substituted and simplified this. So we had sine of two inverse um, trig functions added together, but those are really just two angles that we called alpha and beta. So what we're really evaluating right now is just the sine of our angle alpha plus our angle beta, where alpha and beta are just described in this way, and they correspond to these two triangles. So again, just think of this as the sine of alpha plus beta. Because once we've gotten all the information we need from our two inverse trig functions, we can really just think of these angles as being alpha and being beta. Well, we're gonna need our sine addition formula. Okay, so the sine of the sum of two angles is gonna be the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second plus the cosine of the first times the sine of the second. So the sine of our first angle times the cosine of our second angle plus the cosine of our first angle times the sine of our second angle. And we know we can find these values based on the fact that we now have a fully labeled right triangle representing alpha and representing beta. So here's our alpha triangle, the sine of alpha, the opposite over the hypotenuse. It's gonna be negative nine over 41. Okay, times the cosine of beta. Okay, so the cosine of beta, the adjacent over the hypotenuse is gonna be eight over 17. Okay, plus the cosine of alpha, so adjacent over hypotenuse, 40 over 41, times the 
times the sine of beta opposite over hypotenuse, so 15 over 17. Now notice yet again, we're gonna have the same denominator in both terms. And again, that's not a coincidence. So negative nine times eight is gonna be negative 72. And then 41 times 17, let's see what that one is. 41 times 17 is gonna be 697. Okay, plus two positive numbers multiplied gives us a positive. So 40 times 15, give us 600 divided by 41 times 17 which we know is 697. Okay so since we have that common denominator already we just need to add our numerators. So negative 72 plus 600 is going to give us 528 divided by 697. Well, any time we report a fractional answer, we need to make sure that it's in lowest terms. So how do we know whether or not this reduces? Well, the numerator has a, um, is an even number, the denominator is odd. So we know they can't reduce by anything um, that has two as a factor. It won't reduce by any even factors, but odd factors are not gonna be as obvious. So here's kind of a shortcut for making sure that it's fully reduced. I'm going to type in that fraction as a division, so 528 divided by 697, and I'm going to evaluate that. Okay, so that's going to give me um, a decimal version of this fraction. I'm going to go to the math menu, and I'm going to take that decimal, and I'm going to convert it back to a fraction. So option one arrow frac will convert you to a fraction. Now before I hit enter, let's talk about what's going to happen. It's going to convert it to a fraction. But what your calculator does is it always converts to a fraction in lowest terms. So 528 over 697 simplifies to this particular decimal. We convert that decimal back to a fraction and it's not necessarily gonna convert back to our original fraction. It's going to convert to that fraction in lowest terms. So if that fraction can be reduced, it's going to give us the reduced version of that fraction. So let's see what happens when we press enter. Do we get the original fraction? Do we get a different version of it? Well, when we convert it back, notice we get the same fraction. So what that tells us, because our calculator, again, always reports answers in lowest terms, that tells us that 528 over 697 is already in lowest terms, and so that's going to be our final answer. So that gives you a sense of the different kinds of um, sort of applied problems you can do using these sum and difference formulas. You can use them when you have a known angle that can be split up into additional known angles. You can also use these formulas maybe when an angle is unknown, but you have trigonometric information about it. Either you have a trig ratio related to that angle, or maybe the angle is given in terms of an inverse trig function like it was in this example. We know inverse trig functions represent unknown angles. So we think of each of those inverse trig functions as an angle, and then we can use a formula based on the um, triangles we draw from that inverse trigonometric information. So last but not least, let's do a couple of additional identity verifications um, just using these new identities, these new formulas that we have. So we looked at verification in the last video. Now that we have a new set of identities to use, that opens up some additional possibilities for how we can verify um, some of our identities. So if you remember, the general rule here is we're trying to take one side of this proposed relationship and show that we can algebraically convert it into the other side using only legal algebra. So we can't do anything that's gonna require us to manipulate both sides at the same time. Essentially, all we wanna do is pick a side, whichever one we want, start with that side, and then simplify that side, write it in different forms to show that we can get from one side to the other. If we can show that we can do that in general without substituting any values for our variable or our variables, then that proves that this equation, whatever it happens to be, is true in general. It's true for all values of the variable for which our trig functions are defined. So a good rule of thumb is if you're looking at a relationship like this one, 
pick the side that's going to be more complicated. So here, definitely the left-hand side is more complicated. Sometimes you'll want to pick the other side only because maybe it's, um, it's a side where you could easily find an identity to use to simplify it. It's not a set rule that you always pick the more complicated side. Pick the side where it looks like you could either simplify it or maybe you, could, you know an identity that you could use to do something with that side. So I'm going to start with the left hand side. So cosine of 3 pi over 2 minus theta. Okay, and we want to show that this is equivalent to negative sine of theta for any theta, completely in general. Well, what do we know? We know that this is not the same thing as cosine of 3 pi over 2 minus cosine of theta. We know if we take the cosine of two angles that have been subtracted, we have a cosine difference formula. So let's flip back over and find that formula. The cosine of two angles that have been subtracted is the cosine of each of them, the product of that, plus the product of the sine of each of them. So using that formula, this is the same thing as the cosine of three pi over two times the cosine of theta, not minus, but plus the sine of three pi over two times the sine of theta. Okay, well cosine of theta, sine and theta, those are variable because we don't know what theta is. But cosine of three pi over two and sine of three pi over two, those can be reduced based on what we know about the unit circle. So the cosine of three pi over two, the x coordinate at three pi over two, is going to be zero. So I'm going to sub in my zero there. So that's going to be zero times the cosine of theta. Okay, plus the sine of three pi over two, so the y coordinate at three pi over two, which is going to be negative one, and that's going to be multiplied by the sine of theta. Well, this term, anything times zero is just zero. So what we're left with is negative one times sine theta, which we can write as negative sine theta, and that was the other side, that's what we want to simplify to. So that confirms that this identity is in fact correct. It is a correct relationship. Okay, let's try another one. Let's try one just a little bit more complicated. So we want to verify that the cosine of this sum times the cosine of the difference with the same two original angles, think of x and y as being angles, is the same thing as the cosine squared of the first angle minus the sine squared of the second angle. Okay, so definitely the left-hand side is more complicated here. And we know just looking at the left-hand side, we've got a cosine sum, we've got a cosine difference. We have formulas to handle both of those expressions. So I'm gonna start with the left-hand side. So cosine of x plus y times cosine of x minus y. And it's the product of those two. Okay, so the cosine of the sum, let's start with that. Notice it's gonna be multiplied by the cosine of the difference. So I'm gonna open up some brackets. First set of brackets will have this expression. Second set of brackets will have this expression, just so we keep things cleaned up and separated. So the cosine of the sum, that's gonna be the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. Okay. Now the next one, cosine of the difference, same terms, but it's gonna be addition instead of subtraction. So cosine x, cosine y, plus sine x, sine y. Let's simplify all of that down. We now have two binomials. They need to be foiled in order to simplify this. So first, outer, inner, last. So the first pair, cosine, 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 cosine. So cosine x times cosine x, cosine y times cosine y. So we're gonna have each of those cosine values and they're gonna be squared. So that's gonna be cosine squared x times cosine squared y. 
Now we're going to find something interesting happens with the outer and inner pairs. So the outer pairs, cosine x, sine x, cosine y, sine y. And notice we have two positive terms, so it's going to be positive. So cosine, sine, cosine, sine for each of our angles. Okay. What about the inner pair? Sine, cosine, sine, cosine for each of our angles. But negative times positive is going to give me a negative. So the outer and inner pairs are going to match, but they are equal and opposite because the outer pair gives us a positive and the inner pair gives us a negative. So what that tells us is that the outer pair and the inner pair, equal and opposite, they reduce to zero, they go away. And again, that's because we're looking at a difference of squares. Structurally speaking, this is a minus b times a plus b, where our a and b just happen to be a little bit more complicated than what we see here. If we FOIL something like this out, that's going to be a squared minus b squared. So the first pair squared, the last pair squared, the difference um, of the two. Okay, so the inner and outer terms cancel. The last pair, sine x, sine x, sine y, sine y, a negative and a positive, multiply to give me a negative. So that's going to be sine squared x and then sine squared y. So a lot simpler and a lot closer to our final answer. So let's preview where we want to be. We want to have a cosine squared of x and a sine squared of y and we want the difference. Okay, well we have a difference. What do we have that we want? We've got the cosine squared of x, we've got the sine squared of y. But notice these other two things, cosine squared y, sine squared x, those are not in the final answer. So somehow these two are going to have to go away. Well, how can we get rid of those? Immediately, as soon as you see squared terms, that should be a red flag that a Pythagorean identity may apply. If we could take this cosine squared of y and convert it to something related to sine squared of y, then we'll get rid of this that's not present in the final answer and we'll write it in terms of something that is in the final answer. Now similarly with the sine squared of x, the final answer has a cosine squared of x. If we were to rewrite this in terms of the associated Pythagorean identity, then we can get something that we want and get rid of something that we don't want. So let me write down just the general form and I'm going to use uh, something other than x and y. Let's use theta. So sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. That way we don't use x and y. So cosine squared x, that's good. I want to keep that. Okay, so cosine squared x. Cosine squared y, I want to replace because it's not part of the final answer. So I'm going to use my Pythagorean identity, but I'm going to use a rearranged version of it. If I want something to substitute for cosine squared, I could move my sine squared over, which would give me 1 minus sine squared, and that will give me an equivalent expression to substitute in place of cosine squared. Here it's going to be y's instead of theta's though. So 1 minus sine squared, and it's going to be sine squared of y. Okay, so that's the new version of my first term. Minus sine squared x, which we don't have in our final answer, so we want to get rid of it. So if I want something to substitute for sine squared, if I were to take my identity, move the cosine squared over, I then have an equivalent expression to substitute for sine squared. So in place of sine squared x, I'm going to write 1 minus cosine squared x. And notice when I do this substitution, I'm putting parentheses around it. If sine squared is multiplied by this sine squared, everything we replace it with also has to be multiplied. And so the parentheses will remind us that we have to do that. So what have I accomplished in this step? Well, I've gotten rid of the two trig functions that were not present in my final answer and I've written them in terms of trig functions that are present in my final answer. Well, now I need to clean this up, so be careful about the structure here. We still have two terms, 
And so within those two terms, we have two distributions. So I have to distribute my cosine squared. Here, we're distributing from behind. So we have to distribute the sine squared here. And this whole second pair is subtracted. So we're gonna have to watch our signs as well. So go slowly, go step by step. So cosine squared x times one, it's gonna be cosine squared x. Cosine squared x times negative sine squared y is gonna be negative cosine squared x times sine squared y. I'm gonna put a subtraction and then I'm just going to put the result of this distribution in a set of brackets. So we'll worry about the sign or the um, sign in a second step, that subtraction sign. So one times sine squared y is gonna be sine squared y. Okay, and then negative cosine squared x times sine squared y, negative cosine squared x times sine squared y. Okay, it almost looks like we made it worse, but we haven't. So what's good? What do we have here that's good? Well, we've got a cosine squared x. We've got a negative sine squared y. Well, what about these other two terms that we just created? Well, notice they're the same term. So cosine squared x, sine squared y. This term is negative. And although this term appears to be negative, notice it's being subtracted. So it's really going to be a positive term once we distribute that subtraction. So these two terms are equal and opposite and hence eliminated. And we're left with cosine squared x minus sine squared y, which is exactly what we wanted. So that verifies that identity. So again, the sum and difference formulas, very valuable. They're going to allow us to calculate some trig values for angles that we didn't previous ha previously have labeled on the unit circle. They can also be used here to verify identities. So anytime we can take a pair of angles that we have information about, add them together or subtract them, um, we can find information about angles that we don't currently know things about.